The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. We are very happy this evening to have Professor Ann Kokas with us, who uh, is visiting from, um, currently visiting us from uh, DC, where she's uh, spending a year as a fellow at the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Anne finished her PhD, a dual degree, at UCLA in 2012, where she studied both in Asian language and culture uh, department and in a cinema and media studies department. Uh, and she finished and took a two-year postdoc at Rice, uh, and then joined the faculty of media studies uh, at University of Virginia, where she's at. Uh, now, uh, other than her visiting position at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, and last year uh, published a book about uh, some of what you'll hear about tonight, about uh, Hollywood made in China and, uh, and related topics. Um, and so some of her talk tonight will be about that. And some of her talk tonight will be about a new project she's doing, uh, which has to do with data security and related issues. Um, so we're very happy to hear, uh, uh, even last year's book is still fresh news, right? Uh, so we're very happy to have her here. So please uh, join me in welcoming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. It's such a pleasure to be here today, um, to be in Ithaca on a Southern California day. Uh, I, I was told that Cornell was, was cold in the wintertime. Um, I, I don't even need my big puffy coat. I, I'm kind of disappointed, but also um, very happy to be here among uh, all of you wonderful people today. Uh, so this project emerged, and part of the reason why I like to give a little bit of the background is because I know that some of the people in this audience may be undergraduate students, um, and some of this project emerged from a kind of accidental happening when I was an undergrad. Um, I went abroad to study at, at Beida, at Peking University, um, for a year, and during that process, I had a, um, I had a, I had some roommates in um, at the at, at Beida, and they were I had a Japanese roommate and a Korean roommate. We were all practicing our Chinese together, and all of our Chinese started to sound kind of the same, but not like actual Chinese. Uh, it was like a kind of weird blend of <laughs> of different languages. So I was like, all right, well maybe I need to find a, find a place where I can practice uh, English with a native speaker. So for those of you who are um, here as you know, to learn English and are hanging out with all friends who speak the same language as you, um, then this is also a, a cautionary tale for that. So we, so I moved into a, um, I moved into the Beijing Film Studio work unit apartments um, with a Chinese student who was living there, who was, um, she, she was living there for three generations with her family. Uh, her father, her grandfather was an actor. Her father worked on props and sets, building them. And I became, basically for a year, um, a member of this community. Uh, at that point, uh, which was way back in the day, in 1999 uh, to 2000, the people who were living there um, were all part of the Beijing Film Studio work unit. So everyone involved in the film process. Uh, the work unit was right next to the film studio, the work unit apartments were right next to the film studio. The film studio was right next to the film academy where um, the famous director Zhang Yimou trained. Um, and I had, the op I had the opportunity to work and to, to see produ a production that was being made there um, that was produced by Peter Lohr, who ultimately then later produced the, the Great Wall. So it was this kind of weird microcosm of life in which I got to meet a lot of people in the film academy who, and the film studio, who eventually I went back to and interviewed for my book. So you never know um, what, will ultimately, what will ultimately happen from you know, a, a decision that you make when you're in another country uh, just trying to expand your horizons. You may be talking about it years later to a group of people about a book that you wrote about that experience. So uh, I would just urge you to be adventurous in your, in your explorations. So now, getting to the nitty gritty of all of this, um, since, since, the, since 1999, when, um, when I was at the Beijing Film Academy, a lot has changed in the, in the Chinese film industry. Specifically, the prominence of China as a global film market has become much more, much more significant. China joined the WTO. 
And if you'll note here, um, from 2011 to 2017, there was a rapid increase in the overall size of the Chinese film market. That number in, um, so we're at over $8 billion uh, US dollars per year in 2017. Over 11 billion is the US market size, but you'll notice that China is rapidly, ra rapidly gaining on the size of the US market. Now, when I was uh, first at the Beijing Film Academy, the, the movies that were being made in China, many of them weren't being distributed in the US, or if they were, they were being distributed in, in museums or at universities or in, in film festivals. Now, there's a much greater push for Chinese movies to be distributed abroad, um, largely facilitated by things like the, um, like, like Dalian Wanda's purchase of AMC theaters and Carmike um, in the US. Now, one of the things that this has also changed is the importance of the Chinese box office for Hollywood studios. So if you'll note here, we see that um, while in the US there were over $100 million, there were huge box office takes for these, for these major 2018 films. Um, and I deal totally in high culture, guys, so you're going to see like, lots of images from Transformers and uh, car, movie, car racing movies. But if you'll note here, we see the, um, Transform the most recent Transformers film took in $130 billion in the US. Uh, Fate of the Furious took in 226 in the US, 202 in the US for Coco. But in the Chinese market, um, these in, at least in, um, for, the Fate in, or for the Fate and the Furious and the most recent Transformers film, they took in more um, in China than in the US. And this is, a, this is a major transformation in terms of the global box office. So historically, the US and North American box offices have been the dominant features, the dominant players, and, and really the, the box offices that films have been targeted toward. Now, this transformation is shifting the ways in which Hollywood studios are thinking about the ways in which they make movies. Um, and it's true, this is kind of a gross, fin gross fin crass financial calculus that we're dealing with. It's not related necessarily to a profound new interest in, in Chinese culture or the, the you know, fundamental values of the Chinese people. And this is based on interview research. It's, um, and anyone who tells you that would be lying because seven or 10 years ago when I started studying this topic, there was, there was very little interest. But once the Chinese market started um, rapidly accelerating in growth, this became, this became a much hotter topic. And if we see here, China, even more than its competing markets, is also of great significance. So China is larger than Japan, India, and the UK combined. Um, and these are 2016 numbers. We also see that Asia Pacific is driving growth in the film industry. So when we're looking at these, at these issues, the importance of the Chinese film market is really kind of not only changing how Hollywood approaches um, how Hollywood approaches films for the North American market, but also how Hollywood approaches films for the rest of the world. So, um, yes, sir, did you have a question? Just a little bit confused. Yeah. The, the earlier slide, is the unit a billion dollars? Because is that billion dollars for each, uh, each movie? Oh, no, no, no. I'm actually, that's, that was, that's incorrect. Sorry. This was a, this is a new slide. No, it's, it's, it's millions. I'm so sorry. Million, yeah, 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 yeah. This yeah, is a million. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. This is a new, a new slide because I just got in the box office number, so apologies. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, total 8.6, 8.7 billion. Um, yeah, so here we have um, the, so here we have the total size of the Chinese box office in 2016, 6.6 .6 billion. Um, and if you'll note, China, Japan, UK, all are, um, all are combined are smaller. Now what this means is that in addition to not necessarily targeting the North American market, we're also seeing a move in which we're shifting attention away from these other competing markets like Japan, like, UK, like the UK, and like India. Um, so China is really in many ways sucking a lot of the air out of the room um, with regard to other forms of investment. So what we're seeing is that Hollywood is increasingly being made for China, or at least with China, with the Chinese box office in mind. Um, and this is, this is happening in a wide variety of different ways, both in terms of the types of narratives, the types of characters, the types of funding. And I'll go through the different ways in which that's happening. <coughs> now, US film exports were, to China were worth over $3 billion at a market valued at $8.4 billion in 2017. Um, now, this number is actually not as high as it could potentially be in terms of the demand. Um, and there, because there are serious limitations still for Chinese market access to Hollywood studios. One of those, one of those limitations is the film import quota. 
So the film import quota is part of is part of what it was called the U.S. China Film Agreement, um, which allows which what which expired in February 2017 and allowed 34 films to be imported, 34 U.S. films to be imported into the Chinese market um, each year. Now, what this ultimately means is that there is a limitation on the number of foreign films that can enter the market. This film import quota did expire in February 2017, and as many of you may have noticed, um, the US and China have, over the past year, been renegotiating and redefining their relationship. So the film import quota has not necessarily been the, the top priority uh, on the Xi-Trump agenda, though it was something that they did discuss at the first Mar-a-Lago meeting. Um, however, there's, this is currently in progress, and it's something, um, so for the past year, there's been basically a de facto utilization of the previous quota numbers. Um, now, the interesting part about this is that what it does is create a, an artificial constraint for the growth, the overall growth of U.S. films in the market. Now, as Chinese films become more, more powerful within the Chinese domestic market, this becomes, um, this, becomes an increasing, this becomes an increasingly big issue for Hollywood films that are trying to kind of push through that film quota. Now, Hollywood needs the Chinese market. Um, and we see this because of these financial reasons. Now, at the same time, the Hollywood Dream Factory, um, these, you know, particularly talent in Hollywood, is helping to facilitate and grow the development of the Chinese film industry. Now, the part that's really interesting about this is that we see a, a huge priority in the 12th five-year plan and the 13th five-year plan um, for the growth of the Chinese media and entertainment industries. Now, as well as, this, as well as this January 1st, 2014 statement by Chinese President Xi Jinping about the importance of enhancing and growing the country's soft power. Now, within this context, there is a, a tension that, that we see evolving. On one hand, there is, a, there is a pressure to build Chinese national identity and to, to project China's global image. Um, by the same token, there is a recognition that Hollywood studios offer offer technology and offer expertise that can benefit the overall growth of the Chinese film industry. Now this tension is what drives the is what drives the the challenge the challenging situation that Hollywood studio that studios find themselves in in which they are in a very kind of precarious investment environment. So for example, um, one of the exam uh, so for example in 2012 Oriental DreamWorks um, established uh, a joint venture with DreamWorks Animation and made the film and in 2016 released the film Kung Fu Panda. In 2017 that um, Oriental DreamWorks actually pulled out of that joint venture and pulled out of its kind of larger real estate venture called the, um, the Shanghai Dream Center. So we're seeing this kind of volatility in the market in which there's an interest in moving forward and really significant collaborations established, but then as a result of this tension between the role of media as a, as a form of nation building and the role of media as a commercial enterprise, um, sometimes that, that creates conflict and leads to companies to want to, leads companies to pull out of the market. Now, um, DreamWorks Animation isn't the first to pull back from, from their ventures with China, but this is one of the most, most prominent recent examples. Now, at the same time, building China's communication infrastructure and their ability to project global power is really, is really valuable for, for this kind of larger Belt and Road Initiative. And you know, it's the China series, so we can't, talk about the China, we can't talk about the contemporary China series without talking at least once about the Belt and Road, Road Initiative. So this is my, um, this is my Belt and Road slide. Um, now, if, you, if any of you have seen Wolf Warrior 2 or have heard about it, has anyone here heard about or seen Wolf Warrior 2? Just raise your hands high and proud. OK, a couple of you. If you haven't, uh, OK, OK, I see you in the back. Uh, if you haven't seen it, then I would, then I would urge you to take a look. Um, because one of the really fascinating, and I'll, I'll show a clip of it at the very end. So for those of you who haven't, you can kind of check it out a little bit. But one of the things that's very interesting about Wolf Warrior 2 is not only did it take in over $800 million at the, at the, um, at the Chinese box office, but it also lays out a very clear case for why Chinese, for why Chinese investment abroad should be connected with Chinese military, greater Chinese military strength abroad. Um, and a film like Wolf Warrior II is able to make this argument quite profoundly across a wide platform that a lot of people, are, that a lot of people watch and are able to see. Um, and so 
through this pro process, we can see the importance of building popular cinema and building popular media in China with this process of kind of selling China's larger position within the world. Um, Now, it's important to note that within this process, China still does benefit from Hollywood, from Hollywood expertise. And also, Hollywood's, or, and also Chinese films aren't necessarily moving forward um, in the same way in the global box office as Hollywood films are still in China. So if you note here, um, we'll see, we see an example of a kind of prominent Chinese, um, Chinese film that had global, that had global partners um, that made only $362,000 in the US. Um, Wolf Warrior 2, which is a really kind of profound example of success within the domestic market at $854 million in the box office, um, took only $2.71 million in the US. And this is actually quite a significant uh, box office return for a Chinese film in the US. We also see um, this, the, most recent, uh, the most recent iteration of Journey to the West, again, $239 million in China, but only $880,000 in the US. Now, this is, this is significant in not just in the sense that China should be able to perform in the US market, but in the sense that the North American market is still the largest box office market in the world. So in order to truly be able to create um, box office sensations that are able to operate at the largest budgetary levels, it's important to be able to, to perform in the US market as well. All right, how does all this happen? It's very complicated. And this guy, this gentleman right here, Mr. Jackie Chan, is truly the patron saint of all of these collaborations. Without him, without Jackie Chan, none of this would really, most of these collaborations wouldn't happen. And if you look at the different film productions that have been successful, most of them have his fingerprint on it, either as, a, either as a, an executive producer or as an actor. So there are kind of three different ways in which Hollywood studio films enter the market. Um, one is, is imported, and there are a variety of different modes of import. So as we discussed earlier, there's the film import quota currently under negotiation. Um, there are also films that are purchased by Chinese distributors to be, to be distributed within the market. So they don't get a percentage of the distribution revenue. They just, uh, the, stu the distributor just purchases the film outright and then gets whatever revenue they get from the distribution process. We also see there are still pirated films and there are still some films that are distributed because they don't pass censorship um, and they're distributed in the gray market. Though we're seeing much less of that with the professionalization of Chinese digital platforms. And then finally, we also see, um, see co-produced films. So these are films that are collaborative productions between Chinese, and US, between Chinese and US filmmakers that ultimately are distributed within China as domestic films. So co-productions, like these two, um, have a really interesting place in the, in the pantheon of Chinese cultural production. So on one hand, we see a film like Kung Fu Panda 3, which, um, which has a, a wide variety of different kind of linguistic and cultural cues in place in order to be able to appeal to both markets. This was really quite, quite a kind of masterful cultural, cultural enterprise because they had uh, screenwriters in both English and Chinese um, who spoke back and forth to one another about the script to make sure that jokes worked in both languages. Um, also, from an artistic perspective, the animators put um, put a gloss of, or put the top layer of both Chinese and English on the film, or on the just, uh, on the um, um, on the top layer of animation. So when people in China watched the film, it looked like they were seeing pandas speaking Chinese. When people in English language speaking territories watched the film, it looked like they were speaking English. Um, so this was really kind of an innovative cultural um, cultural endeavor, and also a big investment. And in some ways, the, the or, uh, DreamWorks Animation's dis decision to pull out of the Dream Oriental DreamWorks um, venture suggests the challenges of that expense um, and the difficulties of making cross-cultural ventures. And, and I think that in, in many ways, this speaks to a larger issue of the challenges of kind of collaboration between, between China and the US, the kind of vast differences in time and language and um, cultures of production. We also see, in many ways, the regulatory imprint that happens through the co-production process, because co-produced films have to be approved from the pre-production phase all the way through the distribution phase by Chinese regulators in the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television. 
And it's really interesting. So this particular film, Rock Dog, um, began its life as Tibetan Rock Dog. So um, the Tibetan part was taken off. However, there are certain aspects of this, um, there are certain aspects of the Tibetan identity which remain within the film. Um, just not visibly within the name. So for example, the dog is still named Dorji, uh, which is a Tibetan name. Uh, and if you'll, you can kind of see in the costume that he's wearing a Tibetan-esque, um, that the dog is wearing a Tibetan-like uh, costume, or a Tibetan-like clothing. Um, so some traces remain, but, those, but the kind of larger, sig larger cultural signatures were, were erased as part of the co-production process. Um, and I had the opportunity to speak with um, some people who worked on the, on the Rock Dog. I, I had the opportunity to speak with both people who worked on Kung Fu Panda 3 and people who worked on Rock Dog. Um, and people who worked on Kung Fu Panda 3, you know, were DreamWorks employees, so were very kind of forthright about the process, but also very professional about the challenges and um, the challenges and successes. Whereas the people who I spoke with who worked on Rock Dog um, really just kind of highlighted that it was an impossible experience that they never wanted to replicate again. Um, so there are, some, there are some really serious challenges in terms of building, the, building up these collaborations. And generally, with more resources, they're easier. Um, or at a very minimum, they, they, tend to, they tend to progress a little bit more smoothly. Um, but trying to do a co-production with a low budget is, is much, tends to be much more difficult, at least based upon my interviews. So ultimately, Sino-Foreign co-productions are contractual arrangements between a foreign party and a Chinese party to conduct filming in China. And the Chinese party or parties must be production entities um, credited by the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television. Now, this, has created, this structure has created a lot of challenges for filmmakers that are trying to go through the process of doing co-productions. And as a result, um, we've seen in some way, we've seen a decline in co-productions, even though it's a, it's a way to circumvent the film quota. Now what this has led to is the phenomenon of uh, faux productions, which I talk about in my book, which are essentially optimistic efforts to start making a co-production that at some point in the process lose approval by the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television, or the filmmakers choose to pull out of the co-production process because they find it difficult to secure the su a sufficient amount of financing, um, Chinese financing, in order to main maintain their co-production status. They um, find the content restrictions onerous, or they don't have sufficient Chinese content or sufficient Chinese stars. Um, that being said, the really interesting part about this phenomenon is that it allows Chinese regulators to have an imprint on the process of making big budget films. So an example of this is, um, is Transformers 4, in which we see very clearly, much like actually in Wolf Warrior 2, an example of, um, of, a Chinese, of the Chinese defense minister offering to send military ships into Victoria Harbor in order to protect Hong Kong from, um, in order to protect Hong Kong from the Transformers. So it becomes this really interesting opportunity to rehearse China's role in the global, or China's role in this case in the domestic sphere, but China's kind of larger military presence in a, in a safer um, visual space. Uh, and, to accustom, and to accustom both global and local audiences to China's changing role in the global sphere. Now, this isn't only happening in the film, co in the film production landscape. One of the things that's been really interesting is the ways in which different studios have actually become involved in real estate investment in this, in this larger, um, as, part, as a way to both expand their investments in China, but also in order to leverage their intellectual property routinely and regularly to benefit from the growing Chinese consumer market. Um, with a film, someone might go to watch it once or twice. With a, with a theme park, they may go many, many times. So brandscapes, as defined by Anna Klingman, are the, the physical manifestations of synthetically conceived identities transposed onto synthetically conceived places. And this is the important part. Demarcating culturally independent sites where corporate value systems materialize into physical territories. And what we see here is is Disney and other companies attempting to, to move their corporate, their corporate brands onto Chinese, onto Chinese territory with varying different levels of success. 
So as we saw from the DreamWorks example, this decision to pull out because of the challenges there, Disney has, has chosen to stay in. And they've taken, they've taken a really long view of, of, development, of developing this market. In 2005, they actually started the Disney English schools in which um, rather than entering into China with their typical market entry strategy, which is through the television market, which is highly regulated within, in China, um, and very difficult for, for foreign, or really impossible for foreign commercial um, television stations to operate within the Chinese market. They instead entered into the education market, which before the Olympics was expanding quite rapidly. Uh, and as we see here, they created kind of de facto theaters or screening areas in the classrooms themselves. So um, this, is, this is, you can see at the top, that it's actually called the Magic Theater. Um, but also some of, the, some of the classrooms have screens that actually pull down so you, can watch, um, so you can watch Disney content and learn English at the same time. So it's really useful, but it's also, it's also functioning as a way to introduce kids to brand IP that eventually they may affiliate with later. Um, so this happened in 2005 um, and, continue, and continues to this day. But then ultimately in 2009, Disney received approval to, for the project, uh, for the project uh, di received project approval for, um, Disney Shanghai, for a Shanghai Disney Resort, which as you'll note here, and if we think about brandscapes, this is kind of the quintessential example of what Klingman is talking about in that we see the Disney brand really superimposed on an image of Shanghai's Pudong district. So we see here the, um, so we see the Oriental Pearl Tower, the Shanghai Tower, um, and then on top of it all is the Enchanted Storybook Castle, which if you'll note, if any of you are Disney files here, typically they have a kind of, the castles have a very specific uh, literary antecedent, either the uh, Cinderella's Castle or Sleeping Beauty's Castle, castle. but this one, this is, not, this is not from any kind of Western source material. This is merely an Enchanted Storybook Castle, which could come from any storybook around the world. Um, now the part that's really interesting here is we see, you know, we see Disney IP, we see the Disney intellectual property right at the foreground with the castle and with Mickey, or with Minnie, but, and, and China is really at the backdrop. But the really interesting part about the ownership structure of this is that it's um, majority owned by a, by, a, by a group of Chinese companies. So in many ways, while we're seeing this, and, in, and it can, you can look at it as a form of Hollywood imperialism, gone amok, you know, the Sh Shanghai's Pudong district has this major Shanghai resort on, on top of it um, in a place, in a city that was formerly colonized, partially colonized by foreign powers. But if you really look at it closely and you look at how the investment structure is operating, it's also an opportunity for Chinese investors to leverage Disney intellectual property in order to grow the tourism, um, the tourism and, and branding industries in branding and merchandising industries within China. So it's a really kind of complicated and interesting dynamic where we see this, this power play between Hollywood and China operating in this very wholesome space for children um, going on the small world ride, which I don't have a picture of, but it was great. I really hi highly recommend. All right, now, what we can see here is that these are, these are kind of constantly fraught sites and, and films. And these conflicts are only increasing and becoming more challenging as China becomes more powerful and, um, and as Hollywood becomes more dependent on the Chinese market. So one of the things that we see is certain content that's, that is present um, or that's not present. Uh, we see content being excised from films, so a couple of kind of prominent examples, and these are tough to get because it only comes out if something really bad happens and people want to talk about it. Um, so we have an example of uh, World War Z, the zombie making virus was originally going to be from China, uh, but no zombie making viruses uh, from China were in World War Z. And I mean, obviously, like this, this could be a politically sensitive topic because of um, because of the SARS pandemic and concerns about um, and concerns about public health in China. Um, so that was that was removed from the from the film um, before its distribution. Similarly, we see um, Skyfall. Uh, there was a, a scene in which uh, Skyfall, which was shot partially in Shanghai, um, there was a scene in which James Bond, Daniel Craig shoots a Chinese security guard that was, removed from the, that was removed from the film. But kind of what's really interesting is the affirmative changes that we're seeing in these films as well. So in the case of Doctor Strange, 
um, Tilda Swinton's character was originally, and this is, this is a really interesting and complicated example, because in the original source material of Doctor Strange, this would have been a Tibetan character. Um, in, the, in the final version, it's a Celtic, it's a Celtic character. So there are a couple of different ways to read this, and the studio had a really interesting response. So on one hand, we could see this as an example of Hollywood whitewashing, in which uh, you know, yet again, um, a, a Caucasian actor was cast instead of an, an, of an Asian actor. Um, we can also see this as awareness that Benedict Cumberbatch, the star of the film, um, was huge in China and has, has, has a huge following there. Uh, so to have a Tibetan character in a film that was going to have a big release in China would have been politically not astute for the studio. Um, so the studio, in their description and in their explanation, said that they, were, that they didn't want to participate in the original Orientalist discourse of the source material by having a mystical Tibetan presence. So instead, they had a mystical Celt. It's, a, it's an interesting argument. And Maybe it was earnest. I, it's, so it's it's hard to say. Uh, it's a studio spokesperson, so I, you know, you can really you can really take it one way or the other. Um, but it's interesting that, that this is an area of discussion. Similarly, in the case of the of Iron Man three, um, the character that was originally in the source material of Iron Man three, or the source material of Iron Man, was the Mandarin. Um, he was instead uh, played by uh, played as a. British actor who was impersonating an Afghan warlord um, by Ben Kingsley, which was a lot of called the Mandarin, and that was a lot of different kind of interesting cultural permutations. I didn't get any studio explanations for that, but um, but that seems a kind of clear case of of changes made for the Chinese market, particularly because Iron Man three um, was a faux production, so it started off life as a co-production and had to get approval from the state administration of press publication, radio, film, and television. Um, for, for, some China, for filming of some Chinese scenes. And finally, um, one of my favorites is the kind of preponderance of US-Chinese space collaboration that we've seen recently, both in the context of The Martian and in, and in Arrival, where China and the US are, are working together very closely in order, to, in order to build a variety of different kind of important projects in and spatial and, and space and technological collaboration. And one of the things that, you know, in some ways, this to me, as someone who's currently living in, in Washington, uh, seems more improbable than Matt Damon surviving on Mars. Uh, Matt, da Matt Damon's potato growing on Mars um, seems like, it, like it, it has more likelihood of happening than the US and China saying, you know what, let's just be really transparent about our current development of, of space technology. Um, so, so this is really interesting because we're also seeing Hollywood studio films rehearse these different forms of relationships that don't necessarily exist within, the, within our contemporary international relations context. Now, at the same time, we're seeing corporate decision making become more entwined. Studios, um, Chinese studios have, like uh, Dalian Wanda, which has been having some serious challenges lately within the Chinese, uh, within the Chinese government context, uh, purchased Legendary Pictures as well as AMC and Carmike. Um, we're seeing collaborative slate agreements like Huawei Brothers and STX Entertainment uh, working together to make um, to make films um, for both the Chinese and the U.S. market. Um, as well as Netflix releasing their content on uh, Chinese platform iQiyi, uh, in many ways moving away from Netflix's original strategy, which was um, to try to actually operate in China as a platform. Um, so they are kind of moving to greater integration with their Chinese partner from that perspective. Um, now, all of this is happening, but it's, but it's facing increased resistance from both Chinese uh, from both Chinese partners and from U.S. partners um, in both politi uh, particularly political um, leadership. So this is from 2016, but this is actually an issue that has been only growing, import growing in importance. And fortunately, the, it's quite small. But you'll see at the top it says Congress of the United States. And it's a letter from a group of Republican Congress people um, to the Government Accountability Office urging oversight of um, Chinese acquisitions of US entertainment companies um, and other companies through the CFIUS committee. Now, when this was originally released, it seemed absurd 
that we would use CFIUS as a way to regulate the entertainment industry. Um, there was a lot of laughter about Republican extremism. Um, this was in September 2016, so it was a different time, a different, different world. Um, now, right now, there's actually been an increase in discussions about using CFIUS, which is an interagency committee authorized to review. It's through the Treasury, um, through the Treasury Department. It's an inter interagency committee authorized to review transactions that could result in control of a US business by a foreign person um, in order to determine the effect of such transactions on national security of the United States. So whereas China has actually been um, taking a, a much more um, comprehensive view of US participation in the Chinese market um, with regard to national security for um, uh, since China's accession to the World Trade Organization. In this case, we're really seeing over the past two years a shift in how the US is viewing Chinese investment. And this is a really interesting, this is a really interesting challenge because in many ways it, it demonstrates a, a split between political consensus and, and the, the political consensus and the consensus of business people. Um, who are much more interested in, in working with Chinese partners and, and getting Chinese investment. Um, whereas previously there was a, an interest on both sides of, to invest in China with the intention of expanding, liberalizing, and, um, and growing, these, growing these connections. So we can really see this, this move toward um, national security oversight of things like the entertainment industry as a, as a significant shift in terms of how the US is thinking about its relationship with China and how it's thinking about its relationship to Hollywood as well and the, the role that the production of culture plays in terms of projecting US national power. Now, all of this is also happening at the backdrop of, of shifts in terms of how China is controlling the media industries. Um, and this is, really, this is really important because in some ways, film, dist film distribution is really a small, port of, small piece of this pie. We see that in China, the China's cybersecurity, PRC cybersecurity law in 2017 is now requiring critical information infrastructure or critical information infrastructure to be held by Chinese firms, which has huge implications for um, entertainment firms trying to operate in China, foreign entertainment firms trying to operate in China, like Apple, um, like Apple's entertainment sector. Um, but also any other type of company that's attempting to um, store data there. So anything from Apple iCloud data to health data to engineering services data. We also see a kind of tightening of the online distribution of the online distribution space. So publishing services management rules in 2016 prohibit co-ventures as well as uh, foreign operated work units from any online audiovisual publishing, which is kind of what has propelled Netflix's decision to work more closely with their Chinese partners. We're also seeing a shift toward um, more socialist core values in the production of film in China, um, which again has the effect of narrowing who can participate within the market. So socialist core values um, for cast and crew. This is really, so when I was studying at the Beijing Film Academy um, in the directing department, our classmates had to take um, classes in Marxism and Leninism as part of their training in the, as part of their training in any of the departments in the, in the Beijing Film Academy, which in some ways would directly prepare anyone trained in a Chinese film academy um, with, a similar, with a similar curriculum for, um, for being able to pass these, these laws. Now, I also studied at UCLA, and Marxism and Leninism were not required classes. Though we did think about like Marxist anal analysis of film and things like this, but it was, it was a very different form of Marxist-Leninist education. Um, so I think that in many ways, this is really creating a, a national system for cast and, for cast and crew <coughs> development as well. All right, so where are we right now? The U.S. and China are currently renegotiating the U.S. And the U.S.-China film agreement, but who knows what what process that will take. Every time that I speak with someone, uh, either at the embassy or at the State Department or at the um, at the ITC about this process, it's just like we are in negotiations. Period. Um, the U.S. legislated an, an executive branch antipathy toward China's outbound investment is increasing, so we're seeing more movement toward increased oversight with CFIUS. 
um, as well as other different strategies for limiting Chinese investment. But at the same time, the Chinese government is also urging um, companies to pull back on their overseas direct investment in the US um, and focus on Belt and Road initiatives. And then we're also seeing these increased limitations in the online publishing and storage space in China. So what this, is, what this means is that the, the digital, distribu digital distribution platforms, um, which are kind of the, the major growing area for a lot of distribution, um, have, really, have really been constrained. Um, so we're at, an, we're at an interesting crossroads in terms of what we see for the growth and the change of the Chinese film market and, their relation, and China's relationship with Hollywood. Um, but really the kind of biggest story in the past year has been the ways in which Chinese filmmakers have taken, ta have taken talent and expertise from Hollywood studios and actually built really powerful, impressive, literally muscular global product or muscular film products that are suggesting that in the immediate that in the near term future there may be less of a need for collaboration in Hollywood even as Hollywood needs China more. So with that I leave you with what will hopefully play this clip. Okay, wait, hold on. Let's wait one second. Ah, there we go. An example of China's new role in the world. Um, is there a way to put up the volume? Ah, there we go. So the U.S. actor plays a very different role in this particular film. And there aren't um, English subtitles here, but for those of you who don't speak or read Chinese, I, you'll get the idea. So those are Chinese missiles going to save Chinese citizens from a factory in Africa after political destabilization in the country where they had been investing. All right. So as we can see, there's this move toward creating films that in many ways are, are in the mode of earlier Hollywood studio productions, um, like most notably Rambo, um, a way of projecting a sort of muscular global perspective on the role that China will be taking. And, it, and this draws from a lot of work that Chinese filmmakers have done with Hollywood studios. And actually, the post-production and music were still done in Los Angeles, even though this is, a, this is you know, very much a Chinese film. Um, so these technical collaborations still exist, even, even, with, the, even with the growth of really kind of significant Chinese um, Chinese uh, box office success. And as I noted earlier, films like Wolf Warrior, while they're very successful within the Chinese market, um, do present concern for China's neighbors, um, for 
uh, countries in Southeast Asia or in or in Africa or other Belt and Road countries that that might have some skepticism about about China's long-term ambitions. Uh, but by the same token, this really is projecting a very clear vision of of what kind of a powerful global China would look like. Um, so. If you are interested in learning more about these, about these questions, um, my book is Hollywood Made in China. There's some swag at the back, some um, bookmarks, and a discount code. So, uh, But uh, I really appreciate your time and attention. And I really am excited to hear your questions. And this is always my favorite part, is kind of being able to have a dialogue with people about these really dynamic and changing issues. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you.